biotic and abiotic population influences. In this lesson, we're talking about biotic and abiotic factors, limiting factors, tolerance, carrying capacity, symbiosis, predator-prey relationships, population equation, and exponential growth. Biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors are the living or once living parts of an environment. So for example, food, shelter, predators, etc. Abiotic factors are the never living parts of an environment. So for example, temperature, precipitation, air quality, etc. Both biotic and abiotic factors significantly influence population sizes within an ecosystem. Limiting factor. Abiotic factors determine where a species can live. So for example, temperature, precipitation, etc. Biotic factors determine the species success, number of predators, available food, etc. A limiting factor is any factor that places an upper limit on a size of a population. Limiting factor examples. So the availability of food and water would affect how many, if any, organisms can live in an area. Predators to an area would affect the number of organisms prey living in that area, and the temperature of the area affects which animals live there. So for example, polar bears would not be in a desert because they would overheat. Limiting factors. Factors that limit one population in a community may also have an indirect effect on another population. So for example, in this population here, a lack of water and sun limits the growth of flowers. So that's going to decrease our amount of flowers. Less flowers equals less food for grasshoppers, which means less grasshoppers. Less grasshoppers equals less food for frogs, which means less frogs. And less frogs equals less food for eagles, which means less eagles. So you can see how we're impacting more than one species by limiting another. Tolerance. The ability of an organism to withstand a range of biotic and abiotic factors. Different species have different ranges of tolerance. And here's an example of our tolerance graph. The range of tolerance are the conditions that an organism can continue to exist in. Outside the range of tolerance, the organism will not survive. So our optimal zone is going to be our best zone. Zone of stress is where there's going to be less population. And the zone of intolerance is when our species can no longer survive at the extent of its range. So you can see our population is highest here and lowest here until it's zero, outside the zone of intolerance. The optimal zone, as I said, is the best conditions for the organism to survive. That's where you're going to have the highest population. The further you go from the optimal zone, the lower your population. More tolerant species can withstand a larger range of environmental factors, while less tolerant species have a more narrow range. Now, this graph will look similar for different ranges, except we might be a little bit more spread out. So this environmental factor can be everything from temperature to precipitation. But a more hardy species might have a graph that looks more like this, where its population doesn't fluctuate nearly as much as a less hardy species, which may look more like something like this, where its conditions for survival are much more narrow than the more hardy variety. So again, if this was temperature, maybe the less hardy species can survive between 10 and 30 degrees Celsius, whereas the more hardy species can survive everywhere from zero up to 50 degrees Celsius. Carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the number of organisms of one species that an environment can support indefinitely or otherwise forever. It's based on the biotic and abiotic influences within the environment and can change if influences are changed as well. For example, the carrying capacity of a particular prey species will be dependent on the number of predators. If you increase the number of predators, the environment can no longer support that many prey, and our graph will look something more like this. Because since you have more predators, you're going to have less prey. Now, if we remove those predators, our graph will now look like this. We'll be able to sustain more prey because there's less predators. So this would be less predators. This would be more predators. Symbiosis. How organisms live together in an environment is called symbiosis, and there's three main types, mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. Mutualism is when both species benefit from the relationship. So a good example of this are clownfish and sea anemones. Clownfish are protected from predators by the stinging tentacles of the sea anemone. That's these things right here, these pink things. And in return, the clownfish scares away predators that would otherwise prey upon the anemone. And that's right here, that's our clownfish. So the clownfish, as funny as it might seem, will scare away other things that would otherwise eat the sea anemones. So having the clownfish there protects the sea anemone, and having the sea anemone protects the clownfish. Parasitism. One species benefits at the expense of another species. Parasites usually don't kill their host, the animal that they live on, because it doesn't benefit them to harm the thing that benefits them. So for example, ticks on a dog. A tick is a parasite that feeds off the nutrients in the dog's blood. The dog doesn't get the nutrients, so it's harmed. So the tick benefits, whereas the dog is harmed. That's an example of a parasite. Commensalism is when one species benefits from a partnership, gets food, protection, etc., without benefiting or harming the other. So, for example, tigers and golden jackals. These jackals will attach themselves to a particular tiger, trailing it at a safe distance in order to feed off the big cat's kills. So the tiger kills an animal, eats most of it, and then what's left over, the golden jackal eats. So the golden jackal benefits, whereas the tiger isn't affected at all. Predator-prey relationships. A predator is a type of consumer that will seek out and eat other organisms. A prey is the animal that the predator eats. So for example, owl and mouse, lion and antelope. In many cases, they act to regulate each other. So for example, if there are more predators, the population of a prey will decrease. If the prey numbers decrease, there's less food for the predators, so their population decreases. Now we can see that in this graph here. The wolf is the predator, the rabbit is the prey. So 
orange is going to eat a blue. You can see as blue goes up, the number of wolves go up because there's more food for the wolves to eat. As the number of wolves go up, they're going to eat the rabbits, which is going to cause the rabbit population to go down. As the rabbit population goes down, the wolf population goes down because there's less food, and then it cycles back and forth. Population factors. How a population changes, increases, or decreases. You're going to have four main factors. Natality, which is births. Mortality, which is deaths. Immigration, animals coming in. And emigration, animals leaving. And that brings us to our population equation. The new population in an area is based on the old population, plus the number of animals born, plus the number of animals that come in, minus the ones that die, and minus the ones that leave. And that gives us our new population. Exponential growth. Exponential growth is rapid, uncharacteristic growth, which only occurs under certain circumstances for a short period of time. And it can be seen when an organism enters a new habitat that has a lot of resources, or when predators are removed. Think back to our graph about our wolves and our rabbits. If we were to suddenly remove the wolves, our rabbit population would skyrocket. So let's just say we got rid of the wolves right here. At this point, our rabbit population would see exponential growth, as there would be nothing to eat them. And this happened in South Africa, when elephants became protected after many years of people hunting them for their tusks. As a result, their population showed exponential growth in the 1960s and 70s. Unfortunately, hunting still kills thousands of elephants every single year. Before we conclude the lesson, I want you to pause the video and watch number three. Once you've watched the video, you'll have completed the Biotic and Abiotic Influences lesson. Loud.